This month of July is dedicated to the precious blood of Jesus, the blood that has redeemed us from sin, from death, from the world, and from the dominion of Satan. St. John in the book of Revelation tells us that the saints in heaven are those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. By his blood shed on the cross, Christ has made us all into a kingdom and priests to our God. Among the multitude of the redeemed, some are called to a life of special service and consecration in our Savior's kingdom. In today's Gospel, our Redeemer speaks of them, saying, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Pray therefore the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Among those who serve the Lord in a special way are men and women who remain chaste and unmarried for the love of God. St. John says that they follow the Lamb, that is, Christ their Lord, wherever he goes, so as to become first fruits for God and the Lamb. Such Christians, says the Catechism, proclaim in the Church the glory of the world to come. According to the Catechism, all Christians in any state or walk of life are called to the fullness of Christian life and to the perfection of charity. For every one of us, the Catechism teaches that Christ is the center of all Christian life. The bond with him takes precedence over all other bonds, familial or social. Consecrated or religious life, the vocation of monks and nuns and of other vowed men and women religious, is a way to live the baptismal life and the call to holiness more deeply. These consecrated men and women profess what are called the evangelical councils of poverty, chastity, and obedience. There are also many who live a dedicated Christian life by making private vows, or simply by living the evangelical counsels through a personal decision and commitment. You may wonder what the expression evangelical counsels means. Evangelical means related to the gospel, the evangelion, the good news of Christ. And a council is a way of life that is advised and recommended, but not required of everyone as a commandment. Is there a biblical basis for this vocation to follow Christ by a special form of dedication that is not required of everyone? Yes. Consider a well-known episode from St. Mark's Gospel. A rich young man came to Jesus, seeking the way of perfection in holiness. Our Savior called him to renounce all his goods for Jesus' sake and to find true treasure in heaven by following the Lord Jesus. Notice that Jesus did not say this to everyone who followed him. This was a special vocation. That young man refused the Lord's call, but others accepted it. St. Peter himself tells Jesus, Lo, we have left everything and followed you. What then shall we have? Jesus answered, Everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and inherit eternal life. But many that are first will be last and the last first. Jesus tells his apostles, not all men can receive this precept, but only those to whom it is given. There are eunuchs who have made themselves eunuchs for the sake of the kingdom of heaven. He who is able to receive this, let him receive it. Already in the apostolic church there were virgins and widows and penitents and celibates, like the apostles themselves, who had a distinctive vocation as witnesses to Christ's kingdom. About them, St. Paul says this, 
In view of the impending distress, it is well for a person to remain as he is. Those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you that. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please his wife, and his interests are divided. And the unmarried woman or girl is anxious about the affairs of the Lord, how to be holy in body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly affairs, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order, and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord, so that he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do better. Catholic teaching is that a life lived according to the evangelical counsels has a higher perfection, not as an end in itself, but as a means to the end, which is union with Christ. Pope St. John Paul II taught in 1996 that the consecrated life, which mirrors Christ's own way of life, has an objective superiority. The Catechism upholds the same teaching. Certainly no Christian should question the holiness and goodness of marriage. As St. John Chrysostom said, whoever denigrates marriage also diminishes the glory of virginity. The most excellent good is something even better than what is admitted to be good. Marriage and the closely connected blessings of family and property and personal freedom are great gifts of God and necessary for human society. The Christian family is so important that it is often described as the domestic church. Why then do we encourage a baptized man or woman to consider a life of voluntary poverty, chastity, and obedience? First consider this. Not everyone is able to marry. Not everyone can have children. Not everyone has property. Not everyone has personal freedom. Many who have had these blessings have lost a spouse or a child, endured the sorrow of a failed marriage and divorce, or been impoverished or unjustly oppressed. For Christ's followers, no human blessing can be an end in itself, and no human sorrow need crush us unless it leads us away from the love of God. Monks and nuns, and all who live the evangelical councils, by freely renouncing marriage, property, and personal freedom for the sake of the kingdom, are consecrated witnesses to the truth that Christ comes first. Thus we must pray for religious vocations, and for many to live the evangelical councils. In his letter to the Philippians, St. Paul sums up admirably what it means to seek perfection in Christian discipleship. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as refuse in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own.